First of all, I just want to uh, say how excited I am to be here. Um, I don't think you realize how special you are. Fundraisers raising money for the advancement of the kingdom of God to reach the poor, to change lives, is an honorable and a fantastic thing to put your time and effort into. So before we get any further, can I please ask you all to give each other a big cheer for what you're doing and who you are. Give yourselves a cheer. And a clap, come on, it's please. <laughs> yeah, great. So, um, yeah, one of the most challenging aspects of my 22 years since I founded CAP um, has been fundraising. We started in a small home office, myself and my wife, Lizzie. Um, there's the picture. There's me in the office on the first morning. A couple of things about that picture. Uh, first of all, those glasses will never be fashionable. Hallelujah. <laughs> all the haircut. You may even notice, if you look at the, the uh, screen, I couldn't even spell the name of the charity. <laughs> Excellent. I knew you'd like that. Um, yeah, I'm just a lad from Bradford. I left school too early. Um, hey, dyslexia rules KO. Fortunately, my wife has an English degree, or we would have been known as Christians Against Poverty. <laughs> but it's not how you spell it. It's how you live it. It's what it does to you and does through you and how people see the heart of Christ in you for others, which I believe is the most important. The most challenging thing in our journey, yes, the growth has been phenomenal. And yes, we've grown. Our first year income was 10,000 um, pounds. We're now a 12.5 million turnover charity. We're 75% funded, 30,000 regular givers. But if that was hard enough, trying to distill some wisdom and some inspiration and encouragement to you into 20 minutes certainly is a challenge. First of all, fundraising is so vital. When I first started, um, I knew that I could change people's lives. I knew that people could find freedom. I, I saw people come to church. I knew that I could do what God had called me to do. But the challenge was, could I raise the money to make this thing grow, and could I raise the money for it to be sustainable? And CAP has grown, yeah, 650 centres with 1,000 frontline workers. We've got 320 staff, 10,000 volunteers. And it is a miracle, but the biggest single miracle, I believe, is how over these 22 years, we've been managed to build an organisation that raises significant amounts of money. That, I really believe, is a miracle that will perhaps go unnoticed, but for me, stands as a testimony to God and the generosity of his people. I do want to give all the glory, the honor and praise to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Anything we've picked up over the years, anything that's worked, any inspiration, any innovation, any drive, anything in this area has all come from him. And in many ways, I was probably one of the worst fundraisers in the history of fundraising. Um, if you've not had a copy of the story of Cap, you can pick one up at lunchtime, these are free. You'll read of 13 years of incredibly difficult times, 13 years where we as a small and ever-increasing bunch of people struggled to even pay our own wages. Yet behind that challenge was a strategic plan to make sure that fundraising, its importance, its innovation, its drive, its relentlessness was embedded in our organization. And I stand here some 22 years later able to speak of the impact that that's had. So what have we learned? What is the big picture around fundraising? First of all, if, if you're a leader of an organization here, or you have authority in an organization here, or you work for an organization here that is raising money, this number one, unless this is real and true and practical and actually has got legs on it, I am telling you now, you will find this very, very difficult. Your organization has to have fundraising as an organizational priority. It has to. People say, well, surely, John, your overall priority is reaching 20,000 poor people a year. It is, but if we don't raise the money and we don't build sustainability and we don't engage with supporters and we don't get prayer support, and we don't do this one, nothing else follows from it. Number two, regular sustainability 
is worth the effort. Um, people say to me, well, it's okay for you. By the way, lots of people start conversations with it's okay for you. It really lifts my spirit when they start that because I know what's coming. Or a friend of mine wanted me to ask you. That's also another good one. Listen, um, this regular income, these 30,000 regular givers who on average give 15 pounds a month, they have come because we have never given up on regular income, never given up on sustainability. When I first started this, and this may encourage some of you in the room, um, and again, you'll read in the book, I just simply believe that everybody, all my friends and everybody I knew, would obviously give 10 pounds a month to help me. Everybody else woke up with that delusion. Or is it just me? Amen, somebody's there, I'm with you, brother. So I sent, we sent 200 letters out asking people to give 10 pounds a month to support me and Lizzie in our launch of CAP. On the Saturday morning, I basically said to Lizzie, I need to be near the door because I don't think the postman will get them all through the letterbox. <laughs> I even stood behind the letterbox as a wicket keeper. I didn't need to open the door and I didn't need to be a wicket keeper. We got four replies. Three saying, take me off your database. Hallelujah. <laughs> a non-GDPR database, I want to add. And one person said, if you were the last thing on earth that needed funding, I'd still not give you a pound. Okay? Desperate, desperate times. Desperate times. But I had two options. Give up on sustainability or follow the lead that I believe God had placed on my heart, that I could find people who'd be inspired by this thing. That if I carried on and learnt and tried and kept going, that we'd be able to work this thing through. And we eventually did. But certainly not as an overall moment. More as a culture, more as a lifestyle, more as an organisational focus. Secondly, you've just got to be willing to ask. And ask directly. Um, People sometimes say to me, oh, you can ask for money again, aren't you? Again, another encouraging sentence people speak to me. <laughs> and the answer more likely than not is, yes, I am. Because I'm not asking for me. I'm asking for broken and needy people who need somebody to turn up in their home to stop their home being repossessed or make sure that single mothers don't have to sell themselves on the street to feed their children. We ask passionately and we ask directly and I believe that God can do it any way he wants and if he has funded your charity beyond anything you could ever imagine and he's done it through you're not telling anybody about anything you do or asking anybody then please don't tell me because that'll really upset me amen <laughs> but for the rest of us mere mortals getting out there and asking people for money you've got to just get over yourself I even asked the producer of the BBC if he'd become a regular giver for the recent documentary who saw the documentary by the way great Fantastic. I'll just do a pause from it. <laughs> if you've not seen it, you won't know what that is. That's me worshipping live for 30 minutes on BBC TV. You've just got to get over yourselves. You've got to get over yourselves. And you've got to get used to people saying, no, no's okay. No, he's okay. I don't mind no's, but I like to ask because I want to give people an opportunity to use their wealth for the advancement of the kingdom of God. I want people to engage with something that's going to see lives change. I am not going to be ashamed of asking. If you've got a lot of money and you're in the room, I might find you. And if I do, I'm likely to ask you for some money. Hallelujah. So, you know, you can see me. I'm bright. So I can be easily avoided in a big crowd. You have been warned. Your, your work must deliver tangible fruits. This is so, so important. Um, I do give a reasonable amount of my time to, to, to meet with people. We do lots of things in our head office in Bradford for new fundraisers. We go around the country doing seminars to help people. And I often find that it's really hard for people to kind of tell me what they've actually done, okay? Now, I hear my heart here. I'm not critical in any way, shape, or form. But I believe you've got to have some tangible fruit You've got to have something that someone in a few minutes can actually hear from you that what you're doing actually changes people's lives. Amen? People, it's, it's what I call feature that means that benefit. So often when I speak to people in charities, they can talk fantastic about what the charity actually does. By the way, I can do that as well. But what does it do in people's lives is what empowers people to give. 
So we have got 160 staff involved in world-class debt counselling. We're FCA regulated. We have 24 new cases come through every single day. We help 6,000 clients at any one time. It's massive. It's also really boring. Amen? But what it does is breathtaking. So it's not the feature of what you do. It's its impact. And we need to have some fruit. We need to have some numbers of what happens, some examples, some testimonies of lives transformed. That's what people want to give to. People want to give to lives changed. Amen? People don't want to give to FCA regulation. If you do... Please come and see me at lunchtime. I can give you a great pitch on FCA regulation. Your message should be compelling. And it should be brought with emotion. We're creating the image of Christ. He's given us emotions to guide us and encourage us and let us know that we're alive. And people give to things that are emotive. And that's okay because we're created to respond to emotive. If you've seen anything we've ever done, you'll see emotive. Despite what the BBC perhaps wanted to do with their portrayal of the charity and show me as some kind of slightly unhinged Christian, and before you say that's what I am, we'll just let that one pass. They couldn't miss lives changed by the power of the local church, the emotion change in people's lives. It's something that we need to be okay about and we need to be better at. So, CAP works. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why, if not the main reason why, we see so many support our work. But I'm just going to try and do this a little bit with you to sort of show you an example of how you would do this. Okay, so 10 individuals go debt-free every day at Christians Against Poverty. So today, 10 people will get a phone call and go debt-free, single parents with kids, families. Okay, so that's, that's a fact. It kind of feels, it's quite a good fact. Everybody happy with that fact? Yeah, it's kind of okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> hey. No, 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 no. This is what that fact means. When I get on the train and I go home this afternoon, and I get home to my family with my kids, and I've got 19, 17, and 14, so welcome to my world, Christians with teenage children, hallelujah. <laughs> and I sit down and I have, a, I have a meal with my kids, wife's Mark, Liz is at a job club. Listen, there's gonna be 10 families today, for the first time, are gonna have their dinner around a kitchen table. There's gonna be husbands and wives looking at each other with tears in their eyes, barely believing that they are now debt free, that their home is secure that their children can be fed. That's why 10 people going debt free is important, amen? And that's how we need to, to talk about that. Three people will find work through our job clubs today. And they've been out of work for more than two years. Great, it's a great fact. We'll see over a thousand people go out of, find jobs this year who've been out of work more than two years through 173 job clubs. It's kind of okay, yeah? No, 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 no. My wife works at a job club. When she sits down with someone who comes in and watches their face change as she starts to share with them that they are of value. When they come into church and they get their certificate and they found a job and they come into church and their life has transformed and they're not have, their mental illness is reduced and suddenly they've got belief that they are a worthwhile individual. Now that's why job clubs are worth supporting and that's why we're growing them as fast as we can. Not so we've got a big number, but because we've got a significant life change and you will be packed out with this stuff. Lives are being changed across this room, but you have to connect the two together. So there's your facts. That's what happens with cat. But it's by their fruit they will be known. So, in the last five minutes, I wanted to give you some practical, some practical stuff. First of all, um, when I say selling, who feels uncomfortable? Oh, very brave people. If I go any longer, you'll probably all put your hand up. So thank you for being generous. Okay, what about another word? Influencing people. How does that feel to you? How does that feel? Everybody happy with influencing? If you're not happy with influencing, by the way, you might as well pack in being a fundraiser. Hallelujah. <laughs> Seriously. If you're like, well, I'm not sure about influencing people. I'd rather let them make their own mind up. Seriously. Maybe you're in the wrong role. Amen. 
influencing people, moving people in a certain direction, okay, is what I do and it's what you do and it's what your organizations can do. That's what you're doing. You've just got to embrace it. Here's the encouragement for you. Seriously, um, if anybody could get people to do something that they don't want to do, I would suggest it might be me. Amen? It might be. Let me tell you the facts on Christians Against Poverty. Our regular donors that we've got, we have an attrition weight that is almost identical to child sponsorship. Amen? People give because they want to give. You can relax that you're forcing anybody to give any money to anything. Just chill out. Because if they don't want to give, let me tell you, they won't give. Can I have a hallelujah from somebody here? Do you know what I mean? Oh, I'm frightened I'm forcing people. You're not. You're not forcing people. You're not. So these are the powers of influence. These are proven. They're not from a salesman. These are the six principles. And there's a book you can get at the end. So the first thing is reciprocation. People feel obliged to return favors. The second thing, they're looking for authority. They're looking for experts to show the way. They want to act in line with their commitments and they want to be consistent with what they believe and their values. They also like something that's scarce. The less available something is, the more time is running out, the more we want it. Um, I often laughed. You know Concorde? They stopped flying Concorde because nobody went on it. So, they had a, so they basically, if the number of people who wanted to go on it after they told everybody it was going to stop had gone on it before it stopped, it'd still be flying, <laughs> apart from the environmental problem. But hey, it's a nice plane. Liking. The more we like people, the more we want to say yes to them. And social proof. Everyone is looking at what others do to guide their behavior. There's this book that I want to recommend you to, <coughs> recommend to you. <coughs> it's called Yes, The 60 Secrets. The Science of Persuasion. Just so you understand, it's not written by salesmen. Everybody relax. It's not salesmen written. It's written by doctors. It's written by academics, okay, who run 50 experiments to confirm these are the reasons why people make decisions. A really, really crucial book that I would recommend. It's called, yes, I'm going to leave that on screen for you so you can get the details. So, in the last two and a half minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and bring it all together for you, and I'm going to just do a pitch for you to support Christians Against Poverty. Against poverty. Everybody okay with that? And I'm even going to tell you what I'm doing so you can, you can see it based on the six principles. I'm just going to go back to the six principles so you can kind of see them. Are you ready? Good morning, everybody. How are you? You're obviously nervous because you know I'm going to ask you for money. But other than that, you're all right. Okay, listen. Um, the story of Christians Against Poverty, my faith journey, is written in Nevertheless. It's a, it's a book. It's rip-roaring. If you want an easy, sort of relaxed read, this is not for you. But if you want an example of God's faithfulness and a transforming spirit of Jesus Christ in an organization, and a lad from Bradford who lived in a bed with two kids that he couldn't feed, and somehow managed to be part of an organization around the world, this is book for you. This book is free. If you want a free copy of this, you go to our stand. Our guys will give you a free copy. Reciprocation. Everybody heard that one? Reciprocation. Cap works, lives are changed, people find Christ, people's lives are transformed. The London School of Economics recently completed a consultation and found that every pound given to Cap returns a 3.8% return. Martin Lewis says our work is unsurpassed. Authority. The fact that you're here today means you must have a heart for people who are poor. Yep. You must want to see the church at the forefront of social change. Yep. And you want to see the gospel embedded in it, yeah? Okay, well, if that's what you believe, you should support Christians Against Poverty because that's what we do. Consistent with your beliefs and your, and your commitments. And at the end of the day, we believe CAP is going to be used by God to change, to change this nation along with many others. We believe and we've seen over 22 years that God can do abundantly more. And listen, we estimate that only 100,000 people in 20 years' time, we'll be able to say <clears throat> they played a part in Christians Against Poverty's remarkable transformation of this country. So this is only going to be 100,000 people who are going to play a part in a transformation across this nation. Why don't you try to be one of those 100,000? Scarcity. 30,000 other people who believe the poor should be helped, just like you, also 
believe in Christians Against Poverty and give on average the price of a coffee, £3.50 a week, £15 a month. If 30,000 other people believe in this thing and keep giving, that tells you that this is a good place for your money to come. Amen? Well, the amens are quite loud this time. Social proof. And finally, I hope you've heard my heart. I hope you have my passion. I hope you understand I'm just a lad from Bradford who met an extraordinary God as a passion to see people's change, lives change, as mine was through the local church, who believe there's much work to do, that the church should be at the forefront of social change. Hey, we'd love you to join in with Christians Against Poverty. And that is liking. So give yourselves a round of applause.